I'm Catherine Levy. I'm a co-president of the FSSO currently. And as Amy was saying, if you're interested in a career in the State Department or as a for Foreign Service Officer, we have some great um, connections here at campus. And we are very privileged today to hear from David Dearden. David, as um, Corey currently said, is currently serving as the Immigrant Visa Chief at the U.S. Embassy in Amman, Jordan. Uh, Dearden received a master's degree in international studies and, diplo and diplomacy from a school of oriental and African studies at the University of London. Uh, while he was here at BYU, he majored in IR, international, or international studies, at the Kennedy Center with an emphasis in law and diplomacy and minored in both the modern Near East and Arabic language. He participated in Egypt study abroad and completed an independent field study to Syria as well as BYU's Washington seminar. Dearden also served a French-speaking missionary in the Canada-Montreal mission. Please, uh, Amy, in welcoming Mr. Dearden here today. Thank you for the warm welcome. I brought some family, as you can see. Uh, that's my daughter, Britannia, and grandpa. Um, I actually, I'm here for family reasons as well. Uh, we got the family leave time to come back to Jordan because my wife just gave birth to our second child. Her name's Petra. So Britannia and Petra, we have um, children as souvenirs, basically. So we, <laughs> we, we, we like that theme in general. Um, well, to get started, as the title of the little presentation goes, I am a greenie in the Foreign Service. I am on currently what they call my new first tour. Usually it's, a, it's an unusual construction for the Foreign Service. You have a first tour, you have a second tour. I'm on a new first tour. What I'm going to do is kind of walk you through maybe my process, give you a bit of my history. That way, when I turn the time over to you guys for questions, you can ask anything about the process that I went through and the various experiences I've had along the way. So I guess to start off, it's kind of fun to be an Idaho boy in the Foreign Service because not only do I meet all kinds of foreign people who have no idea where Idaho is, I meet all kinds of Foreign Service officers who have never met someone from Idaho. <laughs> And so that often generates an interesting discussion. I mean, the Foreign Service is a career that has traditionally been an East Coast career. I believe back in the earlier days, it was all Yaleys, people from Yale who staffed the Foreign Service. But uh, as information about you know, the US foreign policy, international relations, and just interest in the subject grows, the Foreign Service has really developed into a more multicultural, more representative group of the US. And I find it really interesting, the different colleagues I get to work with, whether they be uh, people I've never rubbed shoulders with before. Um, well, I give you an idea of where I came from, I guess. I uh, was born here in Provo. Uh, my parents were going to BYU. We moved to Hawaii, South Carolina, Indiana, and Idaho. Uh, moved around the states a lot, so I got a bit of an early taste of traveling, maybe a bit of flavor for the career. And I graduated in, uh, well, high school in Rexburg, Idaho, went to Ricks College. And that's really where my foreign service started. Um, I, before my mission, I was interested in doing law international, well, law, business law, maybe corporate law. Then I served my mission and realized I like people too much to go into law. And so then I said, okay, well, let's try humanities. Humanities is fun. So I went into humanities, and while it was lovely, it was very fluffy. You know, <laughs> it's, you know, what it is. And then a good friend of mine, Jerry Hansen, when I was at BYU, he said, hey, come to this international studies class. It's 101, just come sit in the class if you like it. And I sat in there, and I was like, wow, this is really interesting. And our teacher gave you those really annoying uh, 101 class assignments, such as, pick a job off this list and do a report. <laughs> and so I looked at the list and I'm like, foreign service officer, never heard of that. All right, I'll do a report on that one. And uh, that's where it started. I did the report and realized, oh, foreign service officers are US diplomats. That's cool, does that mean I get diplomatic immunity? I want that job. <laughs> and so from then on out, when people ask me, so what are you studying, what do you wanna do when you graduate? I just kinda said, I'm gonna be a foreign service officer just because I did a report on it and had no better idea what to, what to do with my life. So. And then pretty soon I had to start backing up what I said. <laughs> had to make steps in the direction of uh, doing what I wanted to do. And for me, it started, like I said, at Ricks College with that. And it was kind of a culmination of a mixture of events. Um, I was trying to do the Ricks College Honors Program, and I had to take one more class. And the only thing that fit in my schedule was Arabic language and culture and history of Islam. So I took them, they're the only things that fit in my schedule. And then my first year here at BYU, I was in Arabic 101, and 9-11 happened. And I was like, oh, all right, well, I guess this has some uh, career opportunities <laughs> for those of us who are studying Arabic and are interested in the Middle East. And from there, it's just snowballed. It's a chance to 
focus on a goal and move towards it. And for me, that was the Foreign Service. Um, I guess also things that really helped me get an idea of what I was getting into with the Foreign Service was the, some of the programs put on here at BYU, both the study abroad I went on in Egypt. Uh, they also have an independent study program. I went to Syria, basically where BYU kind of washes their hands of you and says, if you come back alive, we'll give you credit, but otherwise we don't know you. <laughs> and, uh, and then the Washington Seminar Program, where I went and did an internship in Washington, D.C., and I did my internship at the State Department. So I got to be in the belly of the beast there, got to really experience the bureaucracy firsthand, because that's one of the most interesting challenges I faced as a new officer, is getting used to bureaucracy. You think universities are bad. Woo! <laughs> but uh, so from between those experiences that I kind of inserted into my, my university life, I mean, it's really easy to go to university for the full four years or six years, as it takes some of us, and you know, graduate and move on to your next degree. But if you don't insert practical experience, be they study abroads, internships, or real world experience, not only are you not competitive when you reach the market, you have no idea what you want to do because you've never really tasted anything. So I highly recommend all Kennedy Center programs. I went on as many as I could and read about most of the rest. Um, so yeah, uh, after graduating from BYU, in international studies, which is a major they no longer offer, but they've replaced it with other nice things. I went on to a SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, which was basically the school that the British Foreign Service set up for their officers, uh, you know, a century or so ago during the, the rule of the empire. And it's really mu very much turned into the school of anti-imperialism. It's kind of completely switched directions as a school. And uh, while I recommend it highly, it's a very interesting school to go to. It gives you a new perspective on the way you see things, different than you'll get in a lot of places here in the US. Going from there, I entered directly into the Foreign Service. Um, it sounds like a nice smooth transition, but it wasn't. Because I originally took, well actually to put a plug in for the Foreign Service student organization once again, um, it was their prep course. They offered a little couple night a week class to kind of let you know what the test was about that I sat in on and helped me pass the test, I believe, because I attended their class, learned at different sections of the test, and I learned what was kind of expected as far as English language usage, job knowledge skills, the essay writing. And so when I took the test, I was not surprised, and I was lucky to pass the written test my first time around. I was like, all right, this is great. Um, things did not go as smoothly as the written on the oral test. I did not pass that the first time around. <laughs> Had to, and as you may or may not know, if you fail any part of the process, you have to start over again at the beginning of the process. So having you know, not passed the oral exam, I had to go back and retake the written exam, and then go and take the oral exam again. And much to my surprise, I passed the second time, probably because I was more relaxed. I was of the opinion, well, when I did my internship in DC, my boss had taken the test seven times and never passed. My boss was a civil servant, and a really smart guy, and really good at his job. He just never had the luck or the you know, lining of the stars to have it work out right for him. And so when I was taking the test the second time, I had no expectations of passing. My goal was to go in and get more experience doing it, because the best way to take the Foreign Service exam really is to get practice taking it. And so when they told me I had passed, I was kind of like, <laughs> really? You're, you're kidding me. They're like, no, you passed. But the strange thing was, is um, while I passed the test, I was 0.1 score away from qualifying for the job I wanted. <laughs> So I passed the test, but didn't quite get the score for the job I wanted. Um, but they have little ways to clear that hurdle. One is if you're a former military, you, you'll get a, you get a bump in your score. Or if you ha can pass language tests for various languages. Most languages, you get a .14 bonus. So that would have put me just into my score range. But for what they had critical needs languages, um, at the time, Arabic, Urdu, Pashto, uh, Mandarin, Chinese, and whatnot, they gave you like a 0.4 bonus. So that kind of really raises your score and gets you a better chance of being hired because they hire you based on your score. And so they said, so, so what do I do now? I passed the test, but I didn't get the score I wanted for the job I want. So does that mean I'm on the hiring list? They're like, and they said, well, technically no. <laughs> because you put down as the track or the cone you wanted to be public diplomacy. You want, no, I wanted to work, I still do want to work with you know, media organizations, student exchange, cultural programs, building bridges of communication between the cultures. That's what I was focused on, what I want to do. And so when I was told, well, you passed the test, but you didn't quite make that, I'm like, okay, does that put me on the hiring list? No. And that was good news for me, because if you pass the test and get onto your hiring list for your cone, you're there for 18 months only. If you're not hired within that 18 months, you start the entire process over again. So this is one of those careers that people often do on the side. You pursue a real career, <laughs> and you take the Foreign Service test on the side, kind of as your dream career that you hope to get at some point. Some people focus on us and just drive, off, drive for it and get it. Some don't. I mean, 
I think Georgetown has a school of foreign service where they focus on, you know, <laughs> the foreign service issues, a school that was created kind of for those things, and a lot of those guys don't even get in. So it's a very difficult and convoluted process. And nonetheless, the benefits, at least for me, have been great. Um, it's been a difficult career thus far. I've only been in three years, but it's been both rewarding and interesting. Um, as I said earlier, this was my, my new first tour. Um, after uh, I passed the written test, the oral test the second time, I got to, well, fill out the story. I realized I had about a year till my security clearances were done. So I decided to go to London and get a master's degree there where you can do 12 straight calendar months and get your degree done. And so I tried to squeeze that in before I went because once you get in, you don't have a lot of time for extra schooling because you're, you're working straight. You join some agencies in DC and they'll pay for you to go to night school and stuff like that. But it's hard to go to night school if you're in, you know, Ouagadougou, you know. So it's nice to get some of your schooling in before you join. But people make their own decisions of how they want to run it. Um, so joining the Foreign Service, I joined in January of 2007. I was uh, in the A100 class, which is your orientation class. And that class really kind of gives you a perspective on what the Foreign Service is. You kind of think you know, and if you haven't done an internship or worked with the State Department before, chances are you don't know. So they sit you down, and you have about two months of speakers, from head ambassadors to office directors who come in and kind of explain the way the Foreign Service works, but also the way the bureaucracy works, because that's one of the things you get to learn how to do, how to you know, live inside or negotiate with the beast itself, the, the, the bureaucracy of the US government. And it really opened my eyes to the way things work. Despite my internship in, in DC, it made the pieces kind of fit together more. So that or A100 orientation, once you're hired, is to, to uh, kind of fit you into the program. At the end of that training, the A100 orientation, they have something called Flag Day. That's where they announce where you're going. Um, for those of you who do or do not know how it works, they give you kind of a bid list, they call it. It's a list of options. And you look at that, and you end up giving them kind of a list. You say, well, I, so they give you, 40 options. If there are like 40 people in your, in your orientation class, they give you 40 options. And then you kind of say, all right, this is my number one, number two, number three, number four, and you turn them into them. And then they look at it and they send you where they want. <laughs> they try to take things into consideration. They say they have a good, a good reputation of like 95% of the people that come through get one of their high level bids, one of the things they've ranked high. And so, you know, they, they do really try to work with you. Uh, for us, we were kind of torn because I came in speaking Arabic. I used my time between passing the written or the oral exam and my master's degree to do the study abroads in Syria and Egypt. And so I was able to pass that Arabic phone test with flying colors, thanks to the three years I spent here in those two study abroads. <laughs> Probably didn't need both of them, but it turned out it worked well. And so I entered the Foreign Service speaking Arabic. So that meant they were going to try to send me speaking Arabic on one of my first tours. And I was excited about that. I wanted to. The problem was the bid list. There was about nine of us in the class who had some Arabic experience. So they put nine positions on there that spoke Arabic. And only two of them would let you bring a wife and or child because the Middle East has some difficult places and like to send the new guys to difficult places. It's kind of like being a, the new guy to law firm, uh, residency, medical residencies. They put you through your, through your loops for the first uh, couple of years. And so, you know, our choices were between, you know, Saudi Arabia, Baghdad, uh, Lebanon. <laughs> Lebanon's a lovely place, though. I've been there. It's a lovely place. <laughs> Um, but you just based on foreign service rules, they couldn't take family members to some of these places. So we came down for us to be able to go to uh, Morocco or to Yemen. And I served as French speaking mission and speak Arabic. So Morocco was the perfect fit. And we were quite sure we were going to Morocco. And so we went to Yemen. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yemen was an interesting and actually a beautiful country with wonderful people. Um, if any of you know anything about Yemen, it's not the most stable country politically. It's having issues with uh, uprisings in the south and also insurgency al-Houthi Shiite groups kind of in the north wanting to rebel and have their own, actually res restore an imamate of sorts. And so the country was having difficulties. And while we were there in Jordan, or Yemen, uh, the embassy was attacked by Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda in Yemen has their own branch. And they, actually, it's funny, I'm sitting at my office and I'm sitting at my window, and I'm sitting there, and I hear, boom. I lean back so I can see my guys in the next office. I go, you guys hear that? <laughs> and then Syria's getting louder and louder. It was basically was incoming mortar rounds uh, towards the embassy. Luckily, they did not hit a direct score on the embassy. If they would have, things probably still would have been fine as well. The embassy is a nicely armored compound. But it kind of was like, you know, interesting, because you all have to, oh, and, you know, most government buildings will have an alarm for when a bomb goes off or something like that. They call it the duck and cover alarm. 
What I found interesting, I did not know this beforehand, the duck and cover alarm goes off after the booms, not before. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I know, I'm gonna cover up now. But uh, so, uh, then about three weeks after that, th what happened with the, with the attack on the embassy is the State Department declared authorized departure, which means if you're non-essential and you wish to leave, you may, because hey, things are getting scary. And we looked at our, you know, my wife and I were there with Britannia, our, our she was young daughter, she was two at the time, and we're like, well, we knew Yemen was kind of an iffy place when we came here, we're, we'll stick it out a bit, we're okay for now. You know, they're just shooting at the embassy, that's understandable on some levels. Um, and so we were okay with that. But uh, about three weeks later, uh, the same group, Al-Qaeda in Yemen, decided to do uh, an attack against the apartment complex we lived in. And it's not like embassy owned or anything like that. It's a private owned, has a wall, a couple guards and some barbed wire. But once again, we're, we're having dinner in our kitchen, eating our first attempt at fajitas in the Middle East, you know, finding all the ingredients is quite difficult. And so we're sitting there having, oh, and streaming conference at the same time. So it was like April 6th or something like that. <laughs> streaming conference. And uh, so we're sitting there having dinner and then I heard the first boom and I knew exactly what it was. So I had enough time to grab the baby and the fajitas <laughs> and yell at my wife to head for the next room when the mortar struck the building across from us and you know, felt the shock wave rattle through the window and press on our chest as we you know, were trying to get out of the room. So then you, were, you, know, you head for the safe room or the room with no windows and you hunker down with your radio and you wait for news. Um, I don't know if it was the fact that conference was streaming or what, but didn't have any real solid fear. Um, it was annoying. <laughs> it was, oh man, this means we're going to have to leave. <laughs> and strangely enough, my wife was more upset we were leaving than I was. And I thought she didn't like, well, she didn't like the place in some ways. In other ways, she loved it. And so uh, at that point, after they settled that down, basically it was, these were hit and run mortar attacks. They weren't storming the walls or anything like that. They're taking pot shots. And, but the fact that the attacks moved from attacking the embassy, which is a hardened compound, to attacking apartments of, you know, just personnel, that raised the threat level enough to go to ordered departure, which means if you were uh, non-essential personnel, that you had to leave. You did not have a choice. So the embassy evacuated down to a staff that could still run it, but they kind of shed the extra people. And I was one of the extra people. In Yemen, I was doing commercial affairs. Um, the foreign, there is a foreign commercial office in the U.S. government that does stuff overseas, but when they can't staff all of their posts, the foreign service officers often pick up the slack. In Yemen, I was wearing what they call, we call wearing many hats. I was the commercial officer, I was the USDA, the Department of Agriculture projects officer, and also the environmental science technology officer, because not all of those offices could all afford to send someone to the smallest, to one of the smaller embassies.